we're ready to start. Uh, Carola, should we start now? Um, yeah, I think we are ready to go. Um, Kathy will go first, and then we can probably just follow the order of the proposal, and everyone uh, will just share their own presentation. And yeah. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so, well, thanks for uh, joining and our session in New Trends in Experimental and Behavioral Economics. This is a collaboration between the Experimental Economics section and the IV section for the AAEA. Um, so, I'm going to keep track of the time. Each presenter is going to have about 10 minutes uh, to present, and we're going to leave questions for the last 10 minutes. When you have one minute left, I'll just show you this card. Um, I hope you see it. <laughs> if not, I'll just cut it after the 10 minutes. Um, so today we're going to start with uh, our seventh presentation uh, with Katherine Fuller from Arizona State University. And then we're just going to follow the other, uh, the order that we have, the original order, okay? So Katherine is going to be presenting about the effect of altruism and selfishness on bits in experimental options. So you can share your screen uh, now, Catherine. Okay, and you can start whenever you're ready and I'll, I'll show you the one minute uh, card. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and um, thank you to the organizers for putting together this session. Um, my name is Catherine Fuller. I'm a PhD student at ASU, and I'm in the job market this year. Um, so I'm presenting the effects of egoism, altruism, and information, and the willingness to pay for sustainability, credence, attributes for coffee, and uh, that I've been working with Dr. Carola Gravitas and Dr. Troy Schmitz. Um, the motivation is approximately 25 million coffee smallholders around the world depend on coffee for their livelihoods. And um, uh, we pay here in the U.S. about 4 to $5 for, for a small uh, cup of coffee. And only less than 1% of that amount goes to the coffee producers. So that's not fair. And we'll agree that that's not enough. Uh, so what can be done to increase their share? And uh, can sustainability practices such as fair trade or rainforest alliance or direct trade improve those actual conditions, um, considering that sustainability practices require higher prices? That leads to my research questions. Uh, would consumers be willing to pay those higher prices? How much are they willing to pay? And most importantly, who's buying sustainable coffee? A little bit of background. Um, almost all economic models um, assume that people are exclusively pursuing their ma material self-interest and do not care about social goals per se. This is the rational economic agent that uh, French Smith referred to in his paper in 1999. Evidence shows, though, that people care about uh, fairness in pricing, in wages, and uh, they have empathy for others. So a couple of concepts that I'm including in this research uh, are altruism as a social behavior to achieve positive outcomes for others rather than for themselves. Uh, biospheric orientation, as I, I like to think about these similar to altruism, but instead of a social behavior as a pro-environmental behavior to achieve positive outcomes for the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, egoism, um, all the opposite to altruism, so considering all options, uh, people will go with the one that gives them the highest utility. And the wormhole effect of giving, um, that is also called the uh, impure altruism, and is described as the emotional reward of giving to others. So it differs from altruism in that uh, a reward is expected in return, and that reward is the joy and the satisfaction of uh, doing your part to help others. So we had a lab experiment, uh, we divided it in two parts. First, we, um, we measure altruism, biospheric, egoistic, and um, the warm glow effect of giving. 
uh, using two different surveys. The first one is the motivational type of values, and the and the other one is uh, warm glow giving. And we build indices measuring these uh, different orientations. So here you can see uh, an example of how we measure uh, these for different orientations. So this is the altruistic. We uh, took the mean and we average and we uh, measure the indices. And then uh, we measure the willingness to pay using big reactions. We had two rounds in which the first one, we sh show them only labels in which they bid. And then um, in the second round, we gave them information of what each label mean, and then they bid again. So this is a real transaction and it, was, it is a non-hypothetical experiment. Here's a little bit of how it looked like. We use five different labels. We use organic, we use direct trade, uh, Rainforest Alliance, fair trade and the, and the combination of fair trade and organic. And then they bid like, as you can see in this table. The sixth one will be the, ref, the profile or the base reference. Uh, and then in the second one, after the second round, we gave them information of which, we, uh, the meaning of each of these labels, and then they bid again. Uh, the model that we use uh, is a double-hearted model. The first one is a private model, so we measure the probability of a participant's decision of whether or not to pay for the alternatives. And then we move to the second hurdle. Uh, we use a truncated regression in which we determine the effect of the independent variables and the willingness to pay, given that the willingness to pay um, is positive from the first hurdle. So this is a, this is a, the big picture of how the, the results look like, uh, but I will break up uh, the results for you. So here in the first hurdle, um, you can see the, the, the different labels. So for example, here, if the copyback has a fair trade and organic label, the participants are 17% more likely to pay for sustainable copy. And after giving them the information of what the label means, it moved to 22%. All of the results are uh, significant and are positive. And then here you can see, I, I add at the bottom, uh, the different uh, motivations. So you can see the warm glow, altruism, biospheric, and egoism, and um, the warm glow effect and the biospheric uh, motivations have a statistically negative influence on the probability that consumers would pay for sustainable coffee in both rounds. And altruistic people are more likely to pay for sustainable coffee also in both rounds. Then when we move to the truncated regression, uh, you can see also that the willingness to pay for all the labels increase. They are all positive and they are all uh, significant too. Uh, some, uh, some increase more than others, but they are all positive. And then when I add the orientation, the motivations at the, at the bottom, you can see that uh, the warm blue effect in the first round, uh, in the second round increase from the first round and is significant and is positive. Um, altruism and egoism are not significant. Um, and biospheric, after we give them the information, it moved from nothing significant to, uh, has a ne to a negative uh, willingness to pay, which was not expected, but we attribute this to the fact that almost all the labels that we put in our study focus on solving social issues uh, more than environmental issues. In fact, the only one that uh, focuses like mostly on environmental issues um, is the Rainforest Alliance, and um, which yeah, main goal is to solve ecosystem issues. So with our study, we found that consumers are willing to pay higher prices for sustainable coffee, and they are willing to pay even more if they know um, the information regarding each of the labels and the efforts that these uh, organizations do and that the willingness to pay in both rounds uh, of consumers driven by the warm glow effect of giving uh, was significant and positive, reinforcing the argument uh, against the self-interest rational consumer. Thank you.
Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we still have two minutes for questions, unless we want to wait until the end um, for questions. So we have two minutes. So if someone has a question for Catherine. OK, so there's no questions in the chat as well. So we're going to continue. And then if some, someone has a question for Catherine, we can do them at the end. OK, thank you. So now we're going to continue with uh, the presentation by Car Carola Brevitus from Arizona State University. So the title of her presentation is Investigating Non-Compensatory Choices Under Eye Tracking. Um, so Carola, you can share your screen now and just start whenever you're ready. I'll show you the one minute card, OK? Um, can you guys see it? Yeah, we can see. OK, um, thanks, everyone, for being here. I changed the title slightly. So the new title is The Effect of the Dual System on Individual Willingness to Pay, the example of Arizona Grown Mental Dates. And this research is joint research together with Ellen Vanu from Wageningen University. And it was funded by USDA under the Specialty Crop Rock Grant. So let me start with a little bit of background on the dual system, which are the cognitive and affective processes. So in standard economic models, uh, we usually rely on cognition and rational thinking. But lately, a lot of research has been calling to incorporate also affective processes in economics. And the reason for that is that product evaluations and willingness to pay measures depend on more than just the pure value of the product attributes because decision making is determined not only by cognitive but also by effective um, information processing. And the studies on information processing that have looked into product valuation and also related decision making have found that attributes are not the only contributors and that they might not even be the most important factor for choice. And against that background, our research objective is to investigate the effect of effective and also cognitive components on consumers' individual willingness to pay. Here's our conceptual framework. So we start with a product stimulus and then the stimulus affects um, the effective system, also the cognitive system. Then we assume that both systems can also interact with each other. If you have a certain emotion towards something, then maybe you are thinking differently about it. And then both systems will build your preferences. And when we talk about the dual system, we see that the effective component entails emotions, motivations, and also attitudes. So for example, if we look at someone who's drinking Coke Zero, the emotion of that person could be, I feel too heavy. The motivation is, I want to lose weight. And then the attitude is, I like Coke Zero because it has no calories. And for the cognitive component, we see that it includes, for example, attention, information processing, and thinking. So then we translate our conceptual framework into this for our study. So we use measure dates as the product stimulus, and then we use emotion and particular for the effective process and visual attention for the cognitive processes. And then we measure the preferences through a choice experiment, but ultimately work with willingness to pay here. Our hypotheses are, um, the more one is worried about certain product attributes, the higher the related willingness to pay. And the second hypothesis is the more attention is paid to a product attribute, the higher the willingness to pay. And then we measure worry by means of simple survey questions. And we use eye tracking to measure visual attention. And we combine the eye tracking with the choice experiment to identify an individual willingness to pay. We uh, collected the data with a lab experiment here at Arizona State University. We had 115 participants. Um, the survey questions that we included 
were how worried are you about pesticide residues in fruits and how worried are you about genetic modification of food? And here's a little bit of background for eye tracking. So with eye tracking, we measure saccades where no vision occurs and then we have the fixations, which in that little picture you can see the yellow bubbles. Those would be the fixations during that time, actual attention happens, the objects are processed in detail and can be used for decision making. And then in the next step, we define areas of interest. So for example, when you have the price, we would draw a little box around the price and then all the fixations in that area of interest is what we use later in the analysis. Here's an example of one choice set with the fixations for all the participants. So you can see it looks really wild, but then you can probably also imagine once we have our areas of interest, all those fixations are measured there. And the choice experiment that we used um, consisted of six choice sets with four alternatives, and we also had an opt-out um, alternative. So if they didn't like either of the alternatives, they could just um, choose to opt out of a choice set. Um, the design included four attributes. We had the price with six levels. We had pesticide-free labeling with two labels, uh, two levels. So the label was, was either present or not. And the same for the GM-free label. And then we had region of origin with three label levels. So either we had Arizona grown medjool dates, California grown medjool dates, or there was no label present. Here's an example of a heat map for the choice set. So you can see where the bright red is. That is where most attention occurred. So that is where we have the longest visit duration. This is just for one participant. And where the bright red spot is, that's actually where the price is. Then here you can see the areas of interest. So we have one for the pesticide-free label, we have one for the GMO-free label, then we have one for the price and one for the region of origin. And here are the descriptive results for emotions as our effective processes. We have the yellow bar which shows the genetic modification and the red bar shows uh, the results for pesticide residues. And when we look at moderately worried and extremely worried, we can see that our participants were more worried about pesticide residues in fruits compared to GMO um, or, or GM modification in, in fruits. And then here are the results for visual attention. You can see this is measured in seconds and the participants uh, spend most time attending to the price and to the pesticide free label and then to the GMO free label. Arizona grown and California grown were attended to considerably less. And that is also uh, reflected in the willingness to pay. So this is for one eight ounce pack of dates and dollars. And the highest willingness to pay of 109 we see for the pesticide free label, followed by 66 cents for the GM free label. And then we still have a positive willingness to pay for Arizona grown of 17 cents, but the willingness to pay for California grown is negative um, with 27 cents. And that is most likely explained by the fact that this study took place in Arizona. Then we look first at how there might be a relationship between the emotion and the visual attention and we regressed worry on attention and we can see that we have a significant and positive coefficient for pesticide free and GMO free labeling. So we already have a, a relationship there. And then when we look at the, the effect of both processes on willingness to pay, again, we find a significant and positive willingness to pay for both. So the more attention was paid to the labels, the higher the willingness to pay. And the more they were worried, the higher the willingness to pay. And we see that this is a little bit higher for the pesticide free label compared to the GM free label. 
And our conclusions are that the more worried someone is, the more attention is paid to the respective labels. We can see that both systems affect willingness to pay. So we do think it is important to not only focus on cognitive components in our models, but also on the affective components. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carola. We still have about one minute for questions. So if someone have, has a question, you have one minute. If no, we can continue. There's no questions on the chat. So. I have a question. So uh, since you have this emotional state and I, you, you show us that emotional states affect the visual attention, do you think that it can introduce identification uh, problem because you cannot disentangle cognitive mechanism from affective mechanism, right? Because visual attention can also be driven by our emotional states. So in that sense, our visual attention is not a good indicator of cognitive state. Um, yeah, I would say given the data that we have, that is kind of really our only way to, to work with here. We ask the questions about worry only after the, the choice experiment. So I, I would hope that it would not bias it because had we asked it be, before, we would have probably kind of primed them to be worried, but we only asked that afterwards. So hopefully yeah. not. Yeah, in, in, because in consumer psychology, the traditional way that you give, you ask them to remember like six digit number, you burden their cognitive uh, like state or cognitive resources and see how it affects, uh, how it uh, translates to end choices. Yeah, we didn't do that. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I was asking that Ahmad on the chat, he asked, uh, how do you measure for worry and how do you control for other processes like excitement? Uh, we just use the scale um, on a scale from one to five, how worried they are. And then we, we included that in the, in the regression. And definitely there are, there are other emotions or other processes, but we did not include that here. Okay, so Ahmed, does that answer your question? Okay, I guess it does. <laughs> so yeah, he said yeah. So we're gonna continue and then we can go back to more questions at the end, okay? Thanks, Carola. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, Uh, can you look at my screen? Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Okay. Mm. Okay, what about now? Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, I'm gonna track time. Okay, well, um, thanks again for coming. Uh, today I'm gonna present a paper on eye tracking and presentation formats in choice and the risk. This is a collaboration with Andreas Dricutis, Jason Loss, and Mark Obama. So as you all know, uh, multiple prices is one of the most popular risk uh, preference elicitation method and one of the most commonly used by economists. This is because it's very easy to use or implement and also very easy for subjects to understand. However, although uh, these advantages, there are some weakness from using this type of elicitation methods. So for example, Harrison et al has pointed out that, that inferences from multiple price lists can be influenced by order effects. Also, Anderson et al. has pointed out that choices in multiple prices can be influenced by the ranges of the values that are used.
However, uh, lately, uh, Dricutis and Jason Lusk um, look into a more fundamental problem with this type of elicitation methods, basically stating that uh, multiple price lists can confound estimates of the shape or the curvature of the utility function with the shape of the pro probability weighting function. Now, in their paper, uh, Rikutis and Lusk uh, look at two different methods, the Holt and Lorry MPL, and the, a new method they introduce, the pay of very multiple price list. Um, first, in the Holt and Lorry multiple price list, uh, remember that in this case, we have the probabilities that are assigned to the high and the low payoffs ch changing across the 10 decision sets uh, while the monetary amounts are held constant. Now, in the new method introduced by the authors, the probabilities are held constant at 50%, and the monetary uh, payouts are changing throughout the 10 decision sets. Now, what the authors found was the, that the standard or the original Holt and Lorry is more accurate at eliciting the shape or the curvature of the probability weighting function, while the pay variant multiple price leads is more accurate at eliciting the shape of the um, utility function. Now we extend on the work by Dricutis and Lusk to examine whether the format in which we present these two multiple price lists to the subjects affect their choices or their risk preferences. Now we went, uh, we go a little bit farther and we incorporate information on the subjects I moved that go into a few of them because of time. So we see that Stewart et al. He modeled the frequency of the different types of eye tracking movements and linked that to risk choice. And they found that people fixate on the probability and the amount equally often. And they usually make more within gamble probability amount transitions. Then we have the study by Fiedler and Glockner who showed that information search occurs mostly within gambles and the direction is not going to change over time. And finally, the study by Garrison and Swart, uh, Swartot <laughs> test, they use uh, structural models to test whether the probability weighting function is going to be associated with distinctive visual behavior. So we took from some of these studies, however, none of them have used these eye tracking um, information and structural models to see how that uh, those effects depend on the format in which the multiple price lists are uh, presented to subjects. So our second questions or research questions are first to see whether the multiple price list format affect the visual attention behavior in choices and the risk. Basically, we want to know whether the format of the multiple price lists affect um, the probability how subjects fixate on amounts or in the probabilities of the outcomes in the lotteries, and also to see whether we find some identifiable pattern in the processing of the attributes of the lotteries across the different multiple price list methods. In this case, Holt and Lorry and Paya varying MPLs. So to answer these questions, we ran a lab experiment at the Human Behavior Lab in, lab in College Station, Texas. In total, 206 subjects participating in our experiment, they were undergraduate students. We did their recruitment through bulk emails. Uh, in order to participate, subjects had to be at least 18 years old and without any uh, eye corrective surgery because of uh, we were collecting eye tracking data. We ran individual sessions from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. to control for time effects and each session lasted about 30 minutes. Now, subjects receive a $10 shop fee for participating, plus opportunity to earn some extra money from the lottery uh, choice task. I want to talk about the experimental task first because this will make things easier to understand the treatments. So subjects first completed two multiple price lists, the standard Holt and Lorry multiple price list, and followed by the pay of varying multiple price list with constant probabilities. The order of the two MPLs was randomized across subjects. 
After that, uh, subjects completed two additional measures of risk preferences, the DOSPERT survey and the sensation seeking scale survey. And finally, they just responded to some uh, questions about their demographic characteristics. We recorded their eye movements using a TX300 eye tracker, and also we use eye motion software uh, for data recording. Now, at the end of the experiment, one of, out of the 20 lottery choices was selected as binding for payment. Uh, we use a bingo page in order to select the uh, binding choice. And um, subjects earn on average $20.63. This takes into account the payouts from the lottery plus the $10 shot fee. Now, over here we have the multiple, sorry, the multiple price list. Um, we see that subjects faced 10 different decisions uh, between two options, lottery A and lottery uh, B. In lottery A, the two, the highest amount was always fixed at $10 and the lowest amount was always fixed at $8. In lottery B, the highest amount was always fixed at $19.25 and the lowest amount was always fixed at 50 cents. You can see that the difference between the two outcomes in lottery A was smaller than the difference in lottery B. And what is changing here is the probability of winning each monetary outcome. Now, when we look at the expected value for option A and option B, we see that for the first four choices, the expected value of lottery A is going to be higher than the expected value of lottery B. So if we expect that a risk neutral uh, agents will switch from lottery A to lottery B in the fifth choice. Uh, now we included the 10 decision or the last decision just to test whether subjects understood the instructions to the experiment, even a risk neutral subject should choose lottery B in the last decision. Now over here we have the information for the pay of varying multiple prices with constant probabilities. You can see that we hold it, we held the probabilities constant at 50% for all the 10 decisions, and we are varying the monetary amounts for the lotteries. Now, this multiple price list was constructed in a way that it matched the Holt and Lorry in terms of relative risk aversion coefficient and their assumptions of expected utility theory preferences. So subjects went through the 10 Holt and Lorry decisions followed, to the, uh, for, followed by the 10 pay of very multiple price list. This was randomized, of course, but each one of the decisions was presented separately on the screen. Now, our experimental design consisted of a between subject design in which the subjects were randomly assigned to one of four treatments. We have a text format treatment, emphasis on probabilities, emphasis on amounts, and emphasis on probabilities and amounts. Here we have an example, sorry, of the Holt and Lorry, uh, the first choice set for the Holt and Lorry. So you can see that in the text format, the um, lotteries were presented, of course, using text, and you see that we can see the probabilities next to each one of the monetary amounts. We always display the monetary amounts on top of the options, the higher monetary amounts on top and the lower monetary amounts at the bottom. Now, our first treatment consists of emphasizing the probabilities um, of getting each outcome. So for to do that, we use these bars in which the height of the bar shows the probability of winning each outcome. Then in our second treatment, we emphasize the amount of the outcomes by changing the length of the bar um, in each one of the outcomes. And in our third treatment, we emphasize both the probabilities and the amounts uh, in the lottery. So we did that by changing both the length of the bars and the height of the bars. So remember the height is going to show the probability and the length is going to show the monetary amount. Now to analyze the eye tracking data, we construct areas of interest um, around the uh, attributes of the lottery. So we have areas of interest for the probabilities, for the graphs, and for the monetary amounts. So in total, we have about uh, 280 areas of interest for each subject 
across the 20 decisions. So the reason for doing areas of interest is because we want to look at the time or the number of fixations that subjects spend looking at the probabilities versus the amount. So I'm going to go very quick through the descriptive analysis. Oh, okay. I'm already have one minute. Sorry. So here we see the percentage of respondents choosing option A. Uh, there's no treatment effects. Basically, the format in which we present the multiple price list does not affect uh, the proportion of choosing option A or the safe choices. Here we have the total busy duration on amounts. We can see that for the treatment in which we emphasize the amount, the total VC duration for amounts is lower for both methods. That makes sense because we're changing the amount and we're, well, in this case, keeping the probability constant. And here we see that there is no treatment effect on the amount of time that subjects spend looking at the probabilities. And we see that for the payout varying method, the total VC duration of probabilities drastically decrease as subjects progress through the experiment, which makes sense because we hold a probability constant here at 50%. So I ran out of time. What we did next is we calculated structural models to see uh, what a treatment effects at, and the effect of the areas of interest on each one of the attributes on the uh, parameters. And now we're, we're doing is trying to classify subjects into, into different types using eye tracking data and also trying to predict choices from these eye movements using the drip diffusion model from Crackbeach et al. Thank you. Sorry, I ran out of time. Uh, so I guess we don't have time for questions, but maybe at the end, at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Um, so now we have our third present for presentation by Marco Palma, Texas A&M, and the title of his presentation is Compliance Effort and Prediction in Choice Models Using Biometric Data. Um, all right. Uh, can you all hear me okay? And can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. So uh, the title of of our presentation is compliance, effort, and prediction in choice models using biometric data. And uh, I might also add uh, looking at heterogeneous or distributional effects of, of different treatments. I think that rather than having just a presentation, what, what we wanted to do here is to, um, to really bring up some issues to collectively as a group uh, think about some things that I believe are critical uh, issues in experimental econ as we move forward and advance our agenda for the section and for the association. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Samir Husseinov, who is officially affiliated with Texas a for a few more months, and then he's uh, moving to greener pastures. Um, so uh, the, the motivation here is just to present some, some of the issues that sometimes we, um, we take for granted. Um, let me just give you an example. Uh, about what I'm talking about here in terms of compliance. And for example, if you have a very simple decision, option, the option on the left and the option on the right, there's a very clear indication of what the treatment is here in terms of having a very simple unilateral um, label, and there's only one difference. So this is kind of like the most simplest experiment you can think of. Um, and so we can potentially very easily uh, find out the difference between an intent to treat versus actually what was the actual treatment effect. In other words, advances in biometrics and, 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 and a lot of you have actually done work on this area. Um, we'll actually look at whether people indeed look at that label and what is the proportion of people that did not look at that label. And this very simplistic uh, decision, the probability of looking at that label is probably very high. Uh, especially when you do it on a computer screen and not necessarily on, on a gondola in a grocery store, but actually there is a lot more time pressure for making a decision. But imagine, as you have seen in some of the previous presentations by Carola and others, when you have a much more complex situation in which the label actually includes a lot more information. So what we have seen is that there's decreasing uh, um, amount of time that people use as you increase the complexity of these labels. And essentially, 
what we have found in, in previous uh, work and the literature uh, has found is essentially that there is people tend to look at more critical information to them uh, but they don't necessarily increase that amount of information so the probability of of really treating a person as you increase the complexity of the decision environment um, is, is, is reduced. And when we do these in a more realistic environment, for example, in a gondola, in a grocery store, or in a very small area, it could be as low as less than 50%, which means that when you set up your treatment for that particular label, 50% of the people in your treatment are actually not seeing the, uh, the information that you expected them to see. So the end result of this, obviously, is an underestimation of uh, the potential treatment effects. But that in itself is an interesting uh, uh, finding or it's an interesting result because the type of information, the placement of the information changes the saliency. And so the, the proportion of people who actually looks at that labor, uh, the label is an interesting uh, uh, piece of information. So this downward bias in estimating the treatment effects can result in false negatives when there's no compliance uh, or very high rates. And it's a problem, um, especially when, when subjects are exposed to multi-attribute, difficult type of decision uh, problems. So we can also see that there can be some masking of the true effect of different policies. And uh, whenever you see um, literature that tends to have very heterogeneous effects or contradictory effects in the literature, I, I'm always very suspicious about compliance and, I'm, and, and whether it has something to do with, 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 with the uh, distribution of subjects and how much they actually comply with the task. Uh, it also is very important when we look at the potential effects of nudges and, and some of the other things. So what I want to do is just give you a couple of examples of things that we've uh, looked into where this seems to be a big issue maybe to use as, uh, as motivation as for us as we move forward. So one of the key questions that we've seen in the literature is what are the consequences of calorie labeling, labeling laws? And we've, uh, we've actually found uh, many studies, the majority of studies, many of, many of them by you guys, uh, that find that calorie labeling, labeling reduces the consumption of calories, as is probably the intention of the policies that are set in place uh, to create these calorie labeling laws. We've also found null effects, studies that show that there's no effect of calorie labels on, on consumption. But we also find studies that in some cases, uh, calorie labeling laws actually increase calorie consumption. So suppose you go to Subway and you order, you were going to order a six inch uh, Subway and then you find out that the number of calories is 300, but you were expecting it to be 600. So you say, okay, I'm gonna order the 12 inch. So there's even some cases in which you find these contradictory results. And so the question is, why is this happening? Um, and what can we do to try to separate these effects? So we use biometric data to look into these results. And essentially, I think it can be very informative along with other variables. Uh, so one of the things that we observe here is that when you look at people comparing two different products in terms of the distance in calorie labeling, uh, the more time indifference uh, or the closer the people look at these two options, which actually it's a sign of, of indifference. If, if I'm pretty close in the side of two, two options and I tend to put the same level of attention to each one of those two options, I'm probably more indecisive. And so you can see that when that happens, there is a big effect of, of the calorie laden laws. And this typically tends to happen when there, when you see a big difference in that uh, uh, calorie difference. However, when you see that people actually self-select to watch one of the alternatives, they make a much quicker decision and then calorie labeling is not really as effective in changing that uh, type of uh, outcomes. Another one that is interesting and that was puzzling to us was this whole literature about self-control and how uh, I think this is one of the areas where you've seen a lot of this scrutiny in terms of replication and this replication crisis. And in psychology, this study has been replicated over a hundred times and 
and, and long story short, sometimes it replicates, sometimes it doesn't replicate. Uh, some people find that an initial act of self-control increases future self-control. Uh, other papers find the complete opposite. And so when we started looking at these, uh, this literature actually um, is, is built upon this notion that an initial act of self-control affects your subsequent self-control. So they typically do an initial self-control experiment. For example, for me, a good self-control experiment would be to reduce the number of of cups of, of coffee that I drink in the morning. And so then you observe what happens in the afternoon uh, when, I, when I might be uh, showing a little bit more emotions because of this lack of self-control. Now, if you're not a coffee drinker, think about it that way. Do you really have this exhaustion of self-control if you're not a coffee drinker? It means that you did not were exposed to that uh, treatment. So essentially, when you start accounting for that um, compliance issue, and you start plugging in the effect of self subsequent self-control, what you see is that there's actually a nonlinear effect that initially increases and then it goes down. And so it kind of gives us an idea that compliance is really the key here to see whether this effect is going to be replicated or not. Because depending on the number of people that are compliers in your experiment, uh, and it's like very subject specific, uh, if you're in the critical mass of people who are non-compliers, you might not see an effect. And indeed, that's what, what we find in this particular paper. Um, also, I think that uh, Jason had made a comment about the, uh, the, uh, the emotional states. And I think that what's important here that we have seen uh, in, in terms of emotion, number one is to try to induce exogenously these emotions. Uh, we know that people, when, when we're angry, we tend to do acts that we might regret uh, in the future. And emotions seem to be emotionally charging people to make decisions. Uh, and so there are many ways in which we can try to start to look at these emotions. For example, Car uh, Carola's work was beautiful there in terms of worrisome. Uh, the question is, when I worry, what is it that is changing? Is it, do I become more loss averse? And, and there, there are situations in which, in which people are exogenously induced with fear, such as, for example, if you look at the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Democrat and Republic, uh, Republican Party uh, speeches over the last week, there is a lot of that exogenous assignment of emotions to people in very emotionally charged topics. And so the question is, what is that doing to people's preferences in terms of time and some other of the things that we care about? But in particular, we've seen that the more emotionally charged a person is in the exogenous condition, even in endogenous situations, the more predictable we become. It is easier if you use any sort of, even a simple logistic regression to look at prediction of what somebody's going to do under a very high emotional state, it's much easier to predict what people are going to do. So, and the last part I want to mention, I think I have a, a few seconds here, is that in some cases, when you look at the aggregate level of treatment effects, uh, there are some cases in which you find null effects or very small effects, but it's really in the distributional changes that happen in these uh, treatments that there might be some interesting information. For example, when you start breaking down food preferences by BMI, are all the groups reacting the same? Uh, are there any particular changes of normal BMI? There's nothing magical about the breakdown of what we define as normal weight, overweight, or obese, but at least it gives us a starting point to think about what happens in these distributional effects. Sometimes the policies that put in, we put in place, we analyze on the aggregate. When the policies are designed to help certain types of individuals, like poor households and SNAP benefits, for example, and so we need to probably start looking into those, those heterogeneous or distributional effects. That's all I have. If you have questions or comments, uh, here's my email and then Samir's email as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Doctor. Uh, we don't have questions. We don't have time for questions now, but we have 10 minutes at the end uh, of the presentations. <laughs> So our fifth presentation um, is by Vicentina Caputo at Michigan State University. And the title of her presentation is Combining Sensory Analysis with Choice to Assess Consumer Valuation for Alternative Meat, meat Products. 
So yeah, we can see the presentation now. Okay. Yeah, so I have a different title also because I didn't have the time to combine sensory data with uh, the choice experiment data. So I will be presenting some preliminary results today of a study um, that I have done in collaboration with other colleagues uh, from Europe, uh, Giovanni and Ellen Vallou, and uh, from Cornell University, uh, Miguel Gomez. So um, the main motivation of this study is quite uh, obvious, um, the market uh, of alternative meat products is growing. There's been also a lot of discussion recently about um, the consumption of plant-based uh, meat alternatives during COVID-19. There was a nice article by Jason in his blog questioning some of the data from um, Nielsen data actually. But overall, you know, we can state in some way that the, we can find plant meat alternatives almost everywhere at this point, um, supermarkets and uh, menu, restaurants menus. And the reason is because there is some sort of demand uh, for those products. And according to some data, the demand or the sales of plant-based products will increase in the near future. So, but for us, you know, uh, what is important or what we're interested in is why do people buy or eat plant-based products. So there are studies saying that uh, the main reasons or the main drivers are uh, health benefits, uh, environmental benefits, or animal welfare concerns. And driven by some of those results, also food companies are promoting their products in their websites by mentioning the reason why they are making meat from plants. So I went to this Beyond Meat uh, website and there was this kind of um, uh, uh, advertising saying, you know, we do produce plant-based meat to improve health, human health, to have a positive impact on climate change and animal welfare concerns and so uh, on and so forth. However, there is a, this recent paper uh, Ellen Ballou and Jason Lask and I have published in Food Policy, which says that actually when, pro when we provide consumers with uh, information on the environmental impact of beef burgers versus plant-based burgers or information about the technology that is used uh, to produce those new um, alternative products, basically the demand, consumer demand doesn't change much. So then the next question is why or what will be the future of those products and what will be the main driver? Um, and if I think about myself as a consumer um, and I like, for example, burgers, and let's say that in the US almost everybody likes burgers, um, the reason that you know, we all like burgers because they taste good. Uh, and so if we translate this kind of personal perception or personal preference about the taste of beef, then if we want to judge the future of plant-based products in, in terms of large markets, right, the next question would be, do plant-based burgers taste like, like beef burgers? And there is a lot of online saying, yes, they taste exactly the same, and um, they people won't notice the difference between plant-based and 100% beef burgers. And then while digging into those kind of uh, newspaper articles, I was kind of, we were kind of, um, it was kind of clear that people were just judging, you know, personal opinions, but there was no, there was no a systematic study looking at the sensory aspects of plant-based products. I mean, in terms of, um, uh, part in uh, publishing academic journals, as far as I know. I see Jason, you like kind of, maybe there is some study that I don't know. <laughs> um, so the main objective of this study is determining the effects of sensory aspects by focusing on taste, some consumer preferences and demand for four different types of burgers. The first one is 100% beef. The second is uh, 
plant-based burgers made using animal-like protein, so the impossible burger, then we tested the beyond burger, and finally we also tested the bland burgers, meaning 70% beef and 30% mushroom. We did a sensory choice experiment at Cornell University. It was done before COVID-19 and um, we had two days of uh, sessions of 20-25 minutes each. We had about 178 individuals and um, respondents were sampled in the town of the college town. They were not vegetarian because obviously they were to you know, taste all the different products. So we just focus on meat consumers and all of them were older than 18 years old. So we did a between subject. Uh, so the experiment actually includes more treatments, but today I will be focusing only on two treatments. These are a between subject experiment with the control, which is the blind testing. And then we have the treatment, which is the informed testing, meaning that people knew before what you know, the product was. Um, so the difference between the two actually is basically in the fact that in the blind testing treatment, uh, consumers were just asked to see the products and then taste the products and then provide some sort of evaluation. And uh, after the sensory evaluation with the relative sensory questions, they were asked to answer uh, nine choice questions. Uh, while in the informed testing, the procedure is the same, but the difference is that before the sensory testing, um, we basically informed consumers about, you know, the type of beef or burgers they were testing. Uh, so, uh, so Vicentina, uh, sorry for interrupting. There's a gray area on the right of the screen uh, that some people are seeing, just in case that's not... Um, can you see it now? Okay, now it left. Okay. Yes. Left. Thanks. So all uh, the um, impossible burger and the animal-based beef burgers were basically purchased or offered by Cornell Dining Center, by the rest was, were purchased in local sto grocery stores. Uh, all burgers were purchased frozen so that, you know, we were not some kind of creating any difference in, in terms of sensory quality. Um, we, we presented respondents with the same quantity and with, they were all, the samples were all served in transparent containers and uh, we uh, participants were um, in the room where the experiments were, da were conducted. There were six computers and each located in separate boot boots. So, uh, in both experiments, in the blind and in the informed experiments, basically there were, were like nine choice questions and the choice questions were uh, composed by, um, each choice question was composed by five alternatives, uh, four uh, product uh, and a non-purchasing uh, uh, option. And in the design of those alternatives, we follow the study by Balu um, and uh, my study with Balu and Jason in food policy. Uh, but while in that study, we were using the lab grown meat as one of the possible alternatives, here we are using the bland burger. So here's some data analysis. So I will present you some descriptive statistics and then I run a mixed logic model for both uh, the uh, blind uh, experiment and the informed experiment. And uh, I then estimated the market shares, unconditional and conditional, implied demand curves and marginal willingness to pay. So here I will, I'll, I'll go quickly with some descriptive statistics. Obviously this was a sensory choice experiment. So our sample is not great in terms of uh, um, uh, representation of the US population. The majority were female. Uh, the average of age was 31, uh, quite you know, well-educated and with an income, the majority were at an income between uh, um, between or above uh, 50, 75 K uh, dollars. All of the, um, we also included some control questions in terms of familiarity and the majority of the respondents in both treatments are quite familiar with the 1% ground beef burgers, while they were some, somehow unfamiliar with the remaining meat alternatives. 
Um, so here there are some predicted market shares. Um, so these predicted market shares were calculated by using um, the estimates from the mixed logit model and by considering all products at five dollars which was the mean price of the different price levels we included in the choice experiment. Um, so as you uh, can see from both the, bla the um, um, con unconditional and conditional market shares, the majority of respondents or above like 35 or 37 percent of respondents uh, prefer 100 percent beef. Uh, and this is in both unconditional and conditional market share. Um, uh, the uh, burger, the um, burger made with the pea protein, which is basically the Beyond Burger, was um, has the lowest market share um, as compared to the other milk alternatives, and this is bought in the blind and informed uh, treatments. Um, and uh, while the Impossible Burger has um, the highest market share uh, in the uh, informed treatments uh, when comparing with the other two meat alternatives, uh, meaning Beyond Burger and uh, Bland uh, Burger. And these um, market shares are also kind of confirmed in the conditional um, market shares. And interestingly, we can also see that uh, in the blind test, people uh, really like the blend burger, meaning 70% uh, beef and 30% mushroom. But then when they are informed about the composition of the burger, their market share decreases uh, by 10% um, uh, in the uh, predicted unconditional market share and the same a sort of uh, trend is observed in the conditional uh, scenario. Uh, then, Gina, uh, sorry to interrupt, we have less than a minute. Okay, yeah, almost done. Then I derived the implied uh, demand curves and here also you can see that it, you know the demand for beef burger is higher than the demand for the other burgers. Um, and um, this is in the blind um, choice experiment the same trend goes in the informed choice experiment, but there is some sort of uh, uh, the, the two demand curve of impossible burger and beef burger coincide when the price is above $7.5. Um, as you can see also the Beyond Burger is the least preferred uh, or demanded uh, meat alternative as, and the impossible burger is uh, has a higher higher market share as compared to the behind burger and this goes even um, and this is the same also in the informed sensory choice experiment when comparing the um, behind burger and impossible burger so the same uh, pattern can be observed when looking at the implied demand curves by products and also I also calculated the marginal willingness to pay which actually doesn't change much for the two plant-based products Beyond Burger Impossible Burger between the two treatments but there's some sort of effects for the beef burger uh, and the blind burger when comparing the blind and informed treatments. So here's a summary of the results. Um, as expected in some way and confirmed by other previous studies, consumers like beef burger more than plant-based product alternatives. Um, a consumer also like blend mushroom burgers more than plant-based burger burgers, but the demand for those uh, burgers decrease when consumers know that, that those burgers are made 70% with meat, uh, beef and 30% with mushrooms and that consumers like the Impossible Burger more than Beyond Burger and by digging online or just googling you know the difference between how people perceive Impossible Burger versus Beyond Burger um, there were some sort of a lot of uh, discussion about the two and from this uh, very marginal observational uh, trend in um, online it was quite clear that people also that people prefer Impossible Burger than Beyond Burger kind of validating in some way our results. 
So thank you for your attention. These are just preliminary results and the next step will be to um, incorporate the sensory data we have into the choice models. Thanks. Thanks, Vicentina. Uh, we're going to move to our uh, sixth presentation. Um, it's going to be by Hayek Katrian from University of Florida. The title of the presentation is Estimating the Treatment Effects of Pollinator-Related Information on Consumers' Environmental Choices. Uh, so Hayek, you can share your screen uh, now. I will be presenting instead, so I'm going to share okay. my, my screen. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So my name is Shuan. I'm also from the University of Florida. Today I will be talking there, the, talking the estimating the treatment effects of pollinator related information on consumers environmental choices are using uh, Lisa, okay. yes, sorry i'm connecting connected to uh, another yeah you can continue okay and using an integrated choice and the latent variable model approach so it is a joint uh, work with my advisor dr hike and so even though I'm quite new to the field of experimental economics, I cannot know that uh, the mixed logic is the standard or is the model in discrete choice mo experimental modeling to estimate individual preference because of its flexibility to allow unobserved individual heterogeneity. And one such kind of unobserved individual heterogeneity is psychological factors such as emotion, attitudes, perceptions. Now, so far, as far as I understand, I might be wrong, so please correct me if I was wrong. So far, the empirical approach is kind of reduced form estimation strategy. What we do is we either split the sample based on participants' responses to attitudes, perception questions, or we interact participants' responses to attitude perception questions with our important pro product attributes. However, as many of presenters has already, have already mentioned, there is a potential endogeneity of participants' responses to attitude perception questions. So in particular, participants who have a high willingness to pay may believe that, okay, the survey or the information provided is more important. Likewise, Participants who indicated a lower degree of attitudes or perception may do so because they play a low value on the survey or on the information. So therefore, when the survey is incorporated with information treatment, this endogeneity situation will be even worse. So here, I think uh, there's uh, is the potential remedy is the so-called integrated choice and the latent variable model, which is not a new. There are some empirical papers already use this ICLV model in transportation to model travel modes. However, they are facing a relatively simpler choice than what we face in our field. So what we are going to do in this research is basically we want to extend the Ben Akiva ICLV model and jointly model consumers' attitudes and their influences on the choice for neonicotinoid labeling preferences. So by doing so, we actually explicitly model the endogeneity issue of individual attitudes toward the neonicotinoids and the pollinators. So this is a structural model approach. To ident we identify the direct information treatment effect by identifying the impact of information on individual attitudes toward the neonicotinoids and the pollinator health. So here is the flow chart of our survey design. So this is basically an online hypothetical experiment incorporated with our questionnaire. So we first ask participants to answer questions related to their exante knowledge, such as their knowledge about pollinator attractive plants and their knowledge about our neonicotinoids. Then participants will be randomly assigned to either the control group or the treatment group. In each group, we have 420 participants. In the control group, 
participants will be view one block of eight annual bedding plants and one block of eight perennial plants. In total, participants will make 16 hypothetical purchase choices. So here's an example of the choice scenario. Participants will choose from a marigold in a bio biodegradable pot labeled with neonic logo or a pentas plant in a conventional con container with a neonic free text, or they can choose to opt out by choosing, I would not buy any of these plants at this time. On the other hand, people who are assigned to the treatment group will be viewing a three minute video. So in this video, there's information describing the negative and the deterministic impact of neonicotinoid on pollinators. So afterwards, both treatment and control people, participants will, will answer questions related to their attitudes toward pollinators and the neonicotinoids. And then we also collect some information on demographics. So here's a summary of their attitudes questions. In total, we ask six questions regarding their uh, perceptions about the neonicotinoids and the pollinators. Because of time limitation, I'm not going through in details about the six indicators, but uh, remember, for the treatment group, these questions were asked after the information treatment. So we can already kind of see there's a significant difference between the control group and the treatment group. So we further did a, a, a Mann-Whitney test to see that five out of their six indicators are significantly different, but we only use four of them based on the principal fact analysis. Now here is our general picture of the ICLA analysis framework. As I mentioned, we have a control group and we have an information treatment group. And uh, we have three sets of variables. So we have observed individual characteristics. We have unobserved individual, individual attitudes, which are oh, it, it, unobserved individual characteristics. In our case, it's particularly about concerns about the potential environmental impact of neonicotinoids on pollinators, which is represented by their attitudes toward uh, pollinators and the neonicotinoids. And here kicks in the information treatment effect. And this is our latent variable model. Meanwhile, together with the observed individual characteristics and the unobserved latent variable, we also have another set of important plant attributes such as type, container type, plant type, and labels disclosing the absence or presence of neonicotinoids, which is of our primary interest. All of these variables enter into the utility function and it de determines which plant consumer will choose. So this is our choice model. So with the, this framework in mind, here are the, some functional forms. So as I mentioned, the integrated model is basically consisting of two parts, a discrete choice model and a latent variable model. I will start with the structural equation for the latent model. So the latent variable, individuals concerned about, our, about pollinators is unobserved, but is determined by a set of individual characteristics. However, it can be represented by their attitudes indicators, I. So in our case, we have selected four indicators. So we have four indicator functions. For the choice model, we, we have this standard random utility model set up. For the, the indirect utility function is determined by a set of important plant attributes. However, we have, uh, as we have this information treatment here, we separate our plant attributes into two subsets. Vector ZI includes plant attributes that will not be affected by the information treatment. And subset Z star will be affected by the information treatment. So in our case, Z vector includes plant type, price, and container type, while Z star contains the neonic free indicator, which will be impacted by the, our information treatment. And uh, our first star is determined by the, is defined by the uh, exponential function, which can be determined by two parameters, C0 and C1. So here's the results from our full information maximum likelihood estimation of their ICLV model framework. 
So I will go through them really quick. So first, it's the, the structural model. So it's clear that we have a significant impact of the information on the latent variable. As I mentioned, we have four indicators, which is in our measurement model. It's also, they are all or statistically significant, indicating they have strong predictive they have strong predictive power of the latent variable. And these are the results from our choice model. Oh, I, I needed to point out that in order to reduce our computational burden, we separated our sample into annual plants and perennial plants, and all this choice model results are from the annual plants for their latent variable model, it's, it's the same because the same participants are making the purchase decision. So we can see that uh, comparing with other two plants, Marigold and the Pentas, the inpatient plant provided the highest utility. And we kind of see that the biodegrade container attribute is varying a little bit depending on which kind of a plant it was pairing with. I hope you still remember their functional form that combined all these six coefficients will provide uh, the impact of the information if of the information treatment on individuals' utility on choosing ionic free plants. And as we expected, that uh, price has a significantly negative impact on their choice on on the choice of three plants. So to conclude, uh, in our study, we basically establish a causal mapping relationship between individual characteristics, attitudes, and the important plant attributes. So we were the first to incorporate the information treatment into the ICLV framework. And uh, we, we use the in additional information on the neonicinoids. We find that this information actually increased the individual environmental concerns and had a positive impact on consumer preference for labels disclosing the absence of neonicotinoids. So this is what I have so far for this study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Xuan. We'll leave the questions for the end. Um, thanks. Uh, our next pre presenter is uh, Brandon McFadden. The title of his presentation is, uh, is it willingness to pay or versus willingness to accept or willingness to pay and willingness to accept? accept. <laughs> uh, so I think Brandon is ready. Uh, Sorry, I need to unmute yeah. myself. I've also got a, uh, I've also got the uh, change of a title here, but it's still a working title. So you got the screen now? You can hear me all right? Yes, yes. All right. So, um, so it's a working title. It's a working title my student here, Danny's working on. This wasn't the thrust of his thesis. This is a, this is a secondary paper, a method paper we're trying to get out of it. Um, so Danny is the first author on this, and this is a new title he's come up with. And he finished the master's program here at Delaware this spring, and he just got a job last week as a um, research economist for the FCC. So big ups to Danny on that. And this is also with Kent Messer, okay. So let me start with a little background. I'm sure everybody knows this stuff, but let me, let me build a background, okay. So willingness to pay and willingness to accept have historically been collected separately and really the defining difference here has always been property rights, right? If you, got a pro if you have the property right of a good, you collect, you elicit willingness to pay, or sorry, willingness to accept. If you don't have the property right, you know, you elicit uh, willingness to pay. Uh, and utility, uh, expect utility theory tells us that, you know, these should be equal, but you know, there's been a lot of research done in this area and we know that they are often not equal for a bunch of reasons, okay? So there's kind of a background. So let me now get into a story about some motivation for this, okay? So I was at a Qualtrics conference a couple of years ago, and I, I grabbed these pictures off, off the internet, but, um, but I was in this room with President Obama, like me and 10,000 of my closest friends, right? We're in this room and, and President Obama gave a talk. They, well, they do what they call with these campfire chats, right? That's what they call these, where they sit by each other and ask a couple of questions. They talk for like an hour. But what you'll see is, you know, you got a couple of bottles of, uh, where are we at? Oh, we got a couple of bottles of water here, okay? 
So, and, and this, there were tons of speakers. There was like Sir Richard Branson, Aston Kutcher, like all these celebs and all these, you know, politicians and famous people. And they've got these bottles of water. And then Oprah, of course, is the headliner. She comes up last, Oprah comes up last. And there's a difference. You know, there's no bottled water here. There's a glass of water, right? He's got the metal straw because he's probably afraid he's gonna spill it on himself, right? He prefers the small mouth of the bottle. It's a lot of people looking at him, Oprah's sitting across. But it started making me think, you know, there's actually kind of, um, like especially now, you think about the reputation or your branding, it can be, you know, hurt by even maybe having a bottle of water. Matter of fact, last year, you, you might have remembered a couple of Marvel bros got into a little bit of a spat because Chris Pratt, like posted this picture with a water bottle and then and then what's his name jason came to him and you know he said i don't like the water bottle and they came and they got in this little spat so anyway so i built the story around bottled water but you can also imagine even something like tap water right so you can imagine in, in this case someone like oprah you know having that bottle of water around her can be costly there are costs associated with this product um and then you can think about the same thing, let's say, with tap water and, and not so much about brand, your personal brand, but your personal health. Okay, so think about, um, so think about the tragedies that happen in places like Flint, Michigan. Okay, so here we have market goods and you can imagine scenarios where there might actually be a negative willingness to pay. Okay, so I'm bouncing back and forth with these two concepts of like willingness to accept and negative willingness to pay. And, and I'm kind of treating them the same way, but again, like historically, it would be willingness to accept if you have the property rights or something. But here I'm arg arguing that there are spillover effects from consumption for personal property rights of things like brand, brand equity, things like this, okay. So the contingent valuation literature has looked at negative willingness to pay. But like I said, this has been typically for non-market goods, okay. And so there has been some empirical evidence of willing a negative willingness to pay for uh, non-market goods. And it's typically when people prefer the status quo you know, relative to some potential policy, okay? So they have a negative willingness to pay for this policy, okay? So while there are these examples for non-market goods, you know, there's not really much in the literature um, for, you know, negative willingness to pay for market goods. And that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're really interested in something like effective demand, right? If you're interested in effective demand, you don't care if somebody's negative willingness to pay or the, or the willingness to pay is zero, right? Because you're probably not gonna give it away. So you're really just focused on people who have a positive willingness to pay. Although, you know, only focusing on positive willingness to pay could theoretically result in, you know, positively biased welfare effects if we aren't taking into account these people that would have a negative willingness to pay. So what we did here is we used an experimental approach to investigate allowing negative willingness to pay for a market good. And we had four treatments, okay? So the first treatment was a willingness to pay only. Uh, so they were just... Um, asked to value um, a bottle of water and a glass of tap water. Okay, so how much would you pay for a bottle of water or a glass of tap water? And one treatment was willingness to pay only. So they essentially could give a value bounded between zero and four dollars. Okay, then there was a willingness to accept only. Okay, so they were said, you know, how much would you have to be compensated um, to consume this, which is, you know, not typically what we do, right? It's, it's, it's a little weird for sure. But so their prices were bounded from zero to negative four. Then this third treatment, they had a willingness to pay willingness to accept choice. So we asked them before showing them, you know, one of these scales, we said, would you have to be compensated to, to consume this? Or would you, you know, be willing to give a positive value? Would you be willing to pay to consume this? The last one was um, a scale in the sense that it went negative to positive. So negative four to positive four. And then we just explained, you know, if you need to be compensated, you give a negative value. If you would you know, be willing to pay for these products, you give a positive value. Okay, so also beyond this idea of kind of negative willingness to pay, we're also just looking at how uh, sensitive some of these results are to kind of different framings of these questions, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we sent out an online survey made trained by Qualtrics. We got a little over, uh, or almost 1400 observations. So uh, let me get into some of the results now. So, so here we have these four treatments, okay? So here's this willingness to pay only, willingness to accept only, the willingness to pay, willingness to accept choice, and then the scale. This is for bottled, the gray is for tap water, okay? So for tap water, for instance, every, all these values were significantly different from each other, right? So no way we asked it, did we get the same value, okay? For bottled water, there wasn't a significant difference between this willingness to pay only and this willingness to pay, willingness to accept scale question, okay? But these other two were, were different, 
Okay, so you know that's that's interesting. It's weird, but you know let's look at it a couple of different ways. Okay, so now the next graph I'm going to show you, we're going to move to people who only uh, chose willingness to pay. Okay, so we're going to look at this treatment, and then we're going to pull people out of these two treatments who gave positive values, right? Because these are going to be these are different from you know, because we also have people in there who gave negative values for these means, right? So here's just the willingness to pay only. So you'll see that we'll have, we have, so when we look at people who just give positive values, there wasn't actually a difference in any of the uh, prices for bottled water through any of those treatments. When we just look at people who give positive values, okay? Now for, for tap water, we find there was no difference between these two and these two, but this choice, giving them the choice at the beginning was a little higher than the willingness to pay only. So essentially priming them like you're gonna give a positive value did seem to elicit a little higher of a value, not a lot, but a little bit than willingness to pay only, but you know, it was significantly different here. So now I'm gonna show you the same thing, but we're moving to the willingness to accept only, okay? So the willingness to accept treatment and then people who gave those negative values in these other treatments, okay? And you can tell like, you know, so we get into, you know, smaller sample sizes here, right? Some of these people willing to give this negative value for tap or bottled water and the ones where they had the choice, you know, there weren't as many people who gave, who gave positive values, all right? So again, no difference for bottled water and the negative values. Uh, a little, again, uh, a little bit more negative, so a little bit more of an extreme value for the willingness to pay, willingness to accept choice, but no difference between willingness to accept only and willingness to accept scale again, okay? So let me look at this one, one more way, one more different way. Let me look at the difference between bottled water and tap water, okay? So, you know, this is within an individual. So what's your difference between the uh, bottled and tap water now that you know, we find that, so when you just look at the difference, the relative difference between the prices of the products, the valuation, there was no difference uh, between these two treatments. So the scale or the choice, uh, the willingness to pay only was a little lower. And of course, as we would expect, uh, there was almost no difference, or I guess somewhat, you know, um, there's no difference here for the willingness to accept only or very little difference between the two products. All right, so what can we conclude here? Well, if if you ask somebody for a negative willingness to pay, it looks like you'll even get it, right? So if you ask somebody, they will give it. And now this might not make much sense as if you're a marketer, right? Because you're not interested in people who give negative willingness to pay. Although I guess I could even walk that back some, right? Because like you could understand situations where they might be interested in those people. Something like the net promoter score, right? This is a tool that's used widely by industry, right? NPS. And it looks at people who are dissatisfied and, and focuses on them. So maybe even it could work with a marketer. Overall, the mean values vary by treatment. However, not so much when only comparing the willingness to pay or willingness to accept values and comparing the differences between the types of water. Um, so obviously there could be more work done in this area, looking at the differences in products, uh, methods, right? This was like a CV, right? Just asking people on a scale from a CV. So although it does seem possible that welfare uh, estimates could be biased, uh, you know, it, 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 if the proportion of the population with negative willingness to pay is not considered or if that proportion is, is very high. All right, I think I got that in on time. Right on time, thank you, Brandon. Uh, we'll leave questions for the end. Um, so now we have our last presenter is Katie Smith from um, University of Tennessee. She's gonna be presenting about cow-calf cow producer preferences for cattle genomics and genetic testing. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Can you yes. see my screen? Okay, if I advance to the next slide, did that work? We see your screen, but it didn't advance to the next slide yet. No. Okay, let me share a different way. Try this one. Did it advance that time? Yep, you are good to go now, Katie. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Smith. I am a graduate student at the University of Tennessee. Um, first, just thanks to everyone that organized this track session. I'm really excited to share my research with everyone here today. The title of my presentation is Tennessee Cattle Producer Preferences 
for bull expected progeny differences or EPDs. Um, my co-authors are my advisor, Dr. Karen DeLong, Dr. Andrew Griffith, Dr. Chris Boyer, Dr. Kimberly Jensen, and Dr. Charlie Martinez. Funding for this grant was provided by the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service Federal State Marketing Program. In the state of Tennessee, um, the cattle and calves sector ranks as the second highest valued commodity in Tennessee's agricultural sector, accounting for almost $550 million. On average, farms in Tennessee have less than 30 head of cattle and nearly 90% of all cattle are finished outside of the state. Given this, bulls and their genomics are very important to cattle farmers in Tennessee. Um, beef cattle producers are always looking for ways to improve in terms of animal efficiency, sustainability, and profitability. And one of the best ways for producers to do this is through natural breeding. So producers select sires and dams based on desirable physical and genetic traits in order to maximize profits. Research shows that bulls introduce most of the new genetic attributes into a herd. Expected progeny differences are calculated using statistical modeling and provide estimates of the genetic value of an animal as a parent. Genomic enhanced EPDs were introduced by the American Angus Association in 2009 they combine EPD information with genetic information, which just results in a more accurate form of EPDs. In 2013, Vestal et al. used a choice set to examine bull producer preferences for EPDs. So this study is kind of taking that research a step further to examine um, producer preferences for genomic enhanced EPDs. The objectives of this study are to determine cow-calf producer willingness to pay for bulls with varying EPDs and determine if they place a higher value on genomic enhanced EPDs, as well as to examine how farm demographics and producer preferences influence the willingness to pay for particular bulls. To achieve these objectives, we created a survey online in Qualtrics and distributed that to Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program participants. Our survey yielded an 18% response rate. We had 1,245 responses. One of the initial questions within our survey asked producers to indicate their primary involvement within the beef cattle industry by choosing from any of the six options listed below. Producers who selected purebred breeder, commercial producer by natural service or artificial insemination were then directed to our bull choice set. We used a between subjects design where half of the uh, participants saw bulls with genomic enhanced EPDs and the other half saw bulls with just regular EPDs. Participants were provided nine bulls to bid on and they were asked to indicate their maximum bid. Um, this chart was provided to participants before they saw our choice set. It includes Angus breed averages of various EPDs. The participants were instructed to assume that the non-highlighted cells, that those values um, were constant among each of the bulls, while the highlighted cell values would vary between each of the nine bulls that they would bid on. Um, this uh, chart shows the, it's a summary of the attribute levels of the survey bulls. We chose eight different attributes and we varied those on three different levels within our choice set. The, the levels, um, those values were obtained from the American Angus Association breed percentile breakdown for non-parent bulls. The low, median, and high values were represented by the 65th, 35th, and 5th quartiles. Our accuracy values were adapted from the University of Tennessee bull test, and these are the same for each attribute level, although they increase by a factor of 0.15 when going from the regular EPD bulls to the genomic enhanced EPD bulls. Our design was programmed using NGene, uh, we used an orthogonal sequential design. So we had three blocks of 27, for a total of 27 bulls, and each participant only bid on one block. 
totaling nine bulls just to avoid fatigue. Here is an example of one of our choice set bulls. So you can see the eight different attributes that we chose to focus on. And producers were shown this and then they were just asked to indicate their maximum bid for this particular bull. We estimated an ordinarily squares regression. We, well, we use that to estimate willingness to pay. Um, willingness to pay is directly elicited from survey respondents represents a producer's value for each bull and is a function of the characteristics possessed by each bull. We hypothesize that farm demographics and farmer preferences will influence producer willingness to pay for bulls. Uh, willingness to pay for bulls will be impacted by varying EPD values and our null hypothesis states that the willingness to pay for EPDs is equal to the willingness to pay for genomic enhanced EPDs. This shows a summary of the variables used in the model. Uh, to save time, I'm not going to go through each of these individually. And then here's just a continuation of that chart. And then here are summary statistics for um, the significant variables used in the model. I just want to point out a couple of these here. The average for EPDs and genomic enhanced EPDs, this question asks producers to rate the importance of each of these characteristics on a scale of one to seven in their bull purchasing decisions. And it's just important to note that the average ranking for EPDs is higher than that of the genomic enhanced EPDs. And here's a continuation of that table. To save time, I'm not going to go through any of these individually. Here are the preliminary OLS model results. I want to point out that income, as income increased, producers were willing to pay $56.60 more for the bull. As percent farm income increased, they were willing to pay $53.5 more. And participants who indicated that they are Master Beef Producer certified were willing to pay three, almost $380 more than those participants who are not Master Beef certified. And then here, I'm gonna highlight um, the EPD results from our choice set. All of these, the all of the EPDs that we included in the choice set ended up being significant in the model, except for the milk EPD. As calving ease direct increases by one unit, um, producers were willing to pay $32 more for a bull. As the docility EPD increased, producers were willing to pay about $12.70 more for the bull. And then we also included a binary variable in the model, which indicates whether participants saw a genomic enhanced block of bulls or not. And this particular variable was not significant in our model. So because that variable was not significant, we can conclude that there was no st statistical difference between willingness to pay for EPDs and genomic enhanced EPDs. So this indicates that producers did not place an increased value on improved EPD accuracy levels provided by the genomic enhanced EPDs. However, producers were willing to pay more as values increased for EPDs such as calving ease direct, docility, and carcass weight. Our results also identified farm and farmer characteristics such as income, percent farm income and master beef producer certification are associated with producer willingness to pay for bulls. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Katie. Uh, thanks to all the presenters and all the participants. We were supposed to finish 30 minutes ago, but no, sorry, just 10 minutes ago. Uh, but we can still take like five minutes if you want to ask questions to any of the presenters or 
just reach to them individually. So, so I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have a question for any of the eight presenters? I just wanted to say great job by everybody. I think this is a really great track session. So thank you for everybody for putting it together, Corolla and Vicentina. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for organizing everybody. I, don't, I might ask Marco a question if that's okay. I thought you kind of provoked several thoughts. <laughs> one, one for me that was this intention to treat versus uh, effect of the treated, you know, treatment on the treated. It seems to me like, you know, I don't know if we're trying to like predict what happens in the real world, we actually want the intention to treat because if, if you have a brand and you're going to add a label and people don't pay attention to it, that, that's like, that's what we actually want a lot of times, although it is a, a downward bias, you know, there's, it is a biased estimate of, of what happens if people actually look at it. So I don't, I don't know, help me think about that. Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that, that we've done in, in some cases, if we actually get real products and, and the actual attention to the labels is one of the outcomes that we're looking into, particularly when we work with, with groups, uh, we've seen that less than 50% of the people actually look at these labels in a realistic uh, grocery shopping environment. Uh, but there are some, some things that you can try to do to, to change that. And so when the question becomes, what type of information do you put? How can you condense the information so that it's easily or more easy for people to process without necessarily making it complex? Uh, and I think that, well, you have uh, several papers and people here where you have increased artificially the number of, of labels in, and, and then we see that there's just a lot of confusion, right? And some people that, that, that generates a lot of of, of confusion, particularly from different segments of consumers that might be different. So I think that I, I agree with you in the wild. This is really what happens. I mean, people have scarce resources, scare time. Uh, we, we, we're starting to use time and time pressure uh, in particular as a way to, to try to mimic in the lab what people might do in the real world. So we exogenously impose a time restriction or time restriction so that we can mimic the process of people having, you know, less than a couple of seconds looking at a product, supposed to when we put it in the lab, they might look at it five times, 10 times more than they would in the, in the real world. And so can we try to simulate those type of, of, of processing information data uh, by inducing exogenously these, these time constraints and see how the quality of choices changes based on that. So I think those are interesting questions that we should probably think about. That's a good question. So thanks, Jason. Does someone else have any other question? Or uh, uh, Carola, do you know when the recording will be posted? No, so we don't know that yet. If I could ask uh, Brendan, Brandon a question, um, just kind of following up on your negative willingness to play using the context of a couple of the talks. Yeah. I, mean, I think that it, negative willingness to play, some of the beef producers I know would feel that way about plant-based meat. Mm. So I think there's an interesting way you can go. Simultaneously, I don't know anybody that hates bees, at least in terms of their role as pollinators. So everybody's going to have a, a stronger willingness to pay for, you know, something that's good for pollinators. So I guess my question is help me think about this. As we, as we do these various studies of what consumers are willing to pay and uh, accept and, and whatnot, does context really matter? I mean, does it matter the underlying product? And um, I don't know, maybe Marco, you can weigh in on that as well. But Brandon, I think I was really intrigued by your idea of a negative willingness to pay because, like I said, I know some, I know some beef producers that probably have very negative <laughs> willingness to pay for plant-based burgers. Well, let's stay on that. What about vegans? What do you think their willingness to pay us for a burger? right? <laughs> We're going to have to pay them. Uh, and then think about like all the motivations that might come into that, whether it be environmental, health, um, dare I say, virtue signaling, whatever it may be, right? I mean, the, the motivation even, I think, which I think is why some of the, a lot of this other work is very interesting is because it's trying to get at some of the motivations, right, of these behaviors. 
Um, just to just to follow up on that for your paper, Brendan, I, I was just reminded we have a paper on bottled water where we tested willingness to pay for um, different types of, of more environmentally friendly plastics and in between participants had the chance to search for information individually 15 minutes and they were in the lab so they really had to search for 15 minutes and, and, they searched. and um, we found that those that were nudged to make environmentally friendly choices they actually had a uh, had they opted out more often after they searched so I feel that is probably uh, related to your willingness to accept because uh, the none was statistically significant before and after information or after they searched and, and the coefficient increased tremendously uh, for those that were not for the, for the uh, uh, environmentally friendly choices. So I think that is really, I, I really like how you compare it to tap water and mm and how it shows up there as well, that people kind of don't really want it, but we push it on them right. all the time to, to take the bottled water. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and if I can ask a question too, I think this is more gonna show my ignorance than anything, but this is kind of for you too, Marco, or anybody in here. So I don't know a lot about like endogenous switching regression models, but the way I understand it is it somewhat like identifies like the the true treatment effect, I think, is like, you know, the goal, uh, essentially. And I just wonder about adding some of that stuff, like, into that type of model, or or, or like a modeling approach versus uh, an attention approach or something. Yes, I think that, that's a good idea. I mean, uh, a good experiment really should rely on exogenous assignment. And, uh, I mean, whenever you have to start doing complicated models to account for some potential issues in the design, then there's probably a flaw in the experiment somewhere. These, to me, have a lot more value when you have something in the sort of a natural experiment, something that happened that people wasn't planning to run an experiment, but all of a sudden there was a policy set in place in this state that was not put in the others, and, and you want to kind of look into, um, into what the, the proper identification. I think that those, to me, are a little bit more interesting. If we have ways to monitor effort, to, to change effort, for example, uh, you, you can pay people differentially, you can uh, increase the stakes, and so that if you're looking at an input variable, you should see uh, a magnifying effect on the outcomes, and so on. And so there are ways that we can try to deal with this if we're designing an experiment in a more um, controlled way using exogenous assignments. So I think that's probably what we need to, to develop further rather than than going the other way. Those are pretty cool too, though. I mean, if you find a natural experiment, those tend to be very well published because they happen in the wild. Uh, there is no intervention from experimenters and they're very informative about the effect of policies in the real world. And so I, I suspect that as we advance forward, it's really about answering questions that are relevant for people, whether it's through an experiment or something else. I want to add something. Uh, I guess it goes to the big debate that whether we can identify causality based on models or design. So I'm on the second side because I believe that the true causality can only be revealed with the proper experimental design. But we can still use models to identify channels. So we have like information, you have treatment, and you have the end goal. You see that there's effect, but you're not sure which channel is active. And also, uh, sometimes you have model, but you have many assumptions. Uh, and like in structural economics, they, they have many unvalidated assumptions. We can use experimental economics at least to make sure that some of these assumptions we can control, we can uh, fine tune and see uh, how these channels are being activated. Well, okay, so we can end now here. Um, so if you have other questions, you can reach the presenters individually. And well, thanks everyone to join and we will make the recording available as soon as we get it. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. bye.